Chapter Seven of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Seven: The Courting of the Reverend Andrew McPhee. Mr. Hardy had never reconciled himself to the understanding that existed between his daughter Millie and Charlie Dixon he resented bindle's share in the romance still more he resented the spirit of independence that it had developed in milly he had however been forced to bow to the storm every one was against him and milly herself had left home refusing to return until he had apologized to her for the most unseemly suggestion he had made as to her relations with charlie dixon sergeant charles dixon of the one hundred tenth service battalion london regiment had gone to the front and milly sad-eyed but grave looked forward to the time when he would return a v c well millikins bindle would cry ow's his nibs and milly would blush and tell of the latest news she had received from her lover uncle joe she would say i can't stand it but for you and there would be that in her voice which would cause bindle to turn his head aside and admonish himself as an old fool it's all right millikins bindle would say charlie's going to win the war and we're all going to be proud of him and milly would smile at her uncle with moist eyes and give that affectionate squeeze to his arm that bindle would not have parted with for the rubies of india you know uncle joe she said bravely on one occasion we women have to give up those we love bindle had not seen the plaintive humour of her remark but had suddenly become noisily engrossed in the use of his handkerchief mr hearty was almost cordial to charlie dixon on the eve of his going to france once this young man could be removed from milly's path the way would be clear for a match such as he had in mind he did not know exactly what sort of man he desired for his daughter but he was very definite as to the position in the world that his future son-in-law must occupy he would have preferred someone who had made his mark men of more mature years he had noticed were frequently favourably disposed towards young girls as wives and mr hardy was determined that he would be proud of his son-in-law that is to say his son-in-law was to be a man of whom any one might feel proud it would not behoove a christian such as mr hardy to wish a fellow being dead but he could not disguise himself from the fact that our casualties on the western front were heavy particularly during the period of offensives since the occasion when milly had asserted her independence and had declined to order her affections in accordance with mr hearty's wishes there had been something of an armed neutrality existing between father and daughter in this she had been supported not only by bindle and mrs hearty but by a strange freak of fate to a certain extent by mrs bindle herself mr hearty had never quite understood how it was that his sister-in-law had turned against him she had said nothing whatever as to where her sympathies lay but mr hardy instinctively felt that she had ranged herself on the side of the enemy but the fates were playing for mr hardy when the reverend mr sopley of the alton road chapel had decided to retire on account of failing health lady knob carrick determined to bring up from barton ridge her country residence the reverend andrew mcfee she had forgiven him his participation in the temperance fate fiasco accepting his explanation that he had been drugged by the disciples of the devil a view that would have been entirely endorsed by mrs bindle had she known that bindle was responsible for the mixing of alcohol with the lemonade the barton bridge temperance fate fiasco had proved the greatest sensation that the county had ever known the mixing of crude alcohol and distilled mead with the lemonade whereby the participants in the rustic fate had been intoxicated thus causing it to develop into a wild orgy of violence resulting in assaults upon lady knob carrick and the police had been a nine days wonder a number of arrests had been made but when the true facts came to the knowledge of the police the prisoners had been quietly released and officially nothing more was heard of the affair it was a long time before lady knob carrick could be persuaded to see in the rev andrew mcfee the minister of her chapel an innocent victim of a deep-laid plot it was he who had seized the hose that washed her out of her carriage it was he who had led the assault on the police it was he who had said things that had been the common talk of all the public-house bars for miles around after mr mcfee's eloquent sermon upon the gadarene swine lady knob carrick had eventually come around and a peace had been patched up between them 
from that day it required more courage to whisper the words temperance fate in barton ridge than to charge across no man's land in france and so it was that the rev andrew mcfee transferred his activities from barton ridge to fulham he was grateful to providence for this sign of beneficent approval of his labours and relieved to know that barton ridge would in the future be but a memory there he had made history for in the bars of the two-faced earl and the blue fox the unbeliever drinks with gusto and a wink of superior knowledge a beverage known as lemon and a mac a compound of lemonade and gin which owes its origin to the part played in the historic temperance fate by the rev andrew mcfee one evening shortly after the departure of charlie dixon mrs bindle was busily engaged in laying the table for supper mrs bindle's kitchen was a model of what a kitchen should be everything was clean orderly neat the utensils over the mantelpiece shone like miniature moons the oilcloth was spotless the dresser scrubbed to a whiteness almost incredible in london the saucepans almost as clean outside as in the rug before the stove neatly pinned down at the corners it was obviously the kitchen of a woman to whom cleanliness and order were fetishes as bindle had once remarked there's only one spot in my missus kitchen and that's when i'm there as she proceeded with her work she hummed her favourite hymn it rose and fell sometimes dying away altogether she banged the various articles on the table as if to emphasize her thoughts her task completed she went to the sink as she was washing her hands there was a knock at the door taking no notice she proceeded to dry her hands the knock was repeated oh don't stand there playing the fool bindle she snapped i haven't time to the door opened slowly and admitted the tall lanky form of the reverend andrew mcfee it's me mrs bindle he said as he entered the room the outer door was open so i just came in oh i'm sorry sir said mrs bindle i thought it was bindle her whole manner underwent a change her uncompromising attitude of disapproval giving place to one of almost servile anxiety to make a good impression she hurriedly removed and folded her apron slipping it into the dresser drawer won't you come into the parlour sir she said it's very kind of you to call na na mrs beendle replied mr mcfee i just come in to to he hesitated but won't you sit down sir mrs beendle indicated a chair by the side of the table mr mcfee drew the chair towards him sitting bolt upright holding his soft felt hat upon his knees mrs beendle drew another chair from under the opposite side of the table and seated herself primly upon it with folded hands she waited for the minister to speak mr mcfee was obviously ill at ease he'll be comin to the sarvice the nicht mrs beendle he began oh yes sir responded mrs beendle moving her head back on her shoulders depressing her chin and drawing in her lips with a simper i wouldn't miss your address ay said mr mcfee gazing into the vacancy as if in search of inspiration finding none he repeated ay mr mcfee's expression was one of persistent gloom no smile was ever permitted to wanton across his sandy features after a few moments silence he made another effort i'm sair concerned mrs beendle he stopped wordless yes sir responded mrs beendle encouragingly i'm sair concerned no to see the wee lassie more at the kirk who oh, sir milly inquired mrs beendle in surprise ay responded mr mcfee the call of mammon is like the blast of a great trumpet and to the unbelieving it is as sweet music it is the call of satan mrs beendle the call of satan he repeated as if pleased with the phrase i'd na like the wee lassie to to i'll speak to mr hearty sir said mrs beendle compressing her lips it's very good of you sir i'm sure to na na interrupted mr mcfee hastily na na mrs beendle my duty it is the blessed duty of the shepherd to be concerned for the welfare he stopped suddenly the outer door had banged and there was the sound of steps coming along the passage bindle's voice was heard singing cheerily i'd rather kiss the mistress than the maid he opened the door and stopped singing suddenly for a moment he stood looking at the pair with keen enjoyment both mrs bindle and mr mcfee appeared self-conscious as they gazed obliquely at the interrupter hallo caught you said bindle jocosely bindle there was horror and anger in mrs bindle's voice mr mcfee merely looked uncomfortable he rose hastily i must be going mrs bindle he said 
then turning to bindle remarked i just come to inquire if mrs beendle was coming to chapel the nicht don't you fret about that sir said bindle genially she wouldn't miss a chance to pray and may we expect you mr beendle inquired mr mcfee by way of making conversation and preventing an embarrassing silence i ain't much on religion sir replied bindle hastily mrs b's the one for that lemonade and religion are things sir what i can be trusted with i don't touch neither then as mr mcfee moved towards the door he added must you go sir you won't stay and have a bit of supper na na replied mr mcfee hastily i hey the lord's work to do mr beendle the lord's work to do he repeated as he shook hands with mrs bindle and then with bindle the lord's work to do he repeated for a third time as followed by mrs bindle he left the room funny thing that the lord's work should make him look like that remarked bindle meditatively as he drew a tin of salmon from his pocket when mrs bindle returned to the kitchen it was obvious that she was seriously displeased the bangs that punctuated the process of dishing up were good fortissimo bangs bindle continued to read his paper imperturbably in his nostrils was the scent of a favourite stew he lifted his head like a hound appreciatively sniffing the air a look of contentment overspreading his features having poured out the contents of the saucepan mrs bindle went to the sink and filled the vessel with water carrying it across the kitchen she banged it down on the stove opening the front and picking up the poker she gave the fire several unnecessary jabs what did sandy want inquired bindle as he got to work upon his supper don't talk to me snapped mrs bindle you'd try a saint you would insulting the minister in that way insultin me cried bindle in surprise why i only cheer old him you'll never learn how to behave stormed mrs bindle losing her temper and her h's look at you now all dressed up and leaving me alone bindle was wearing his best clothes for some reason known only to himself any one would think you was going to a wedding continued mrs bindle not again said bindle cheerfully what was old scotch and soda after he inquired when you ask me a proper question i'll give you a proper answer announced mrs bindle oh lord said bindle with mock resignation well what did the reverend macandrew want he came to inquire why milly was so often absent from chapel i shall have to speak to mr hearty said mrs bindle bindle's reply was a prolonged whistle e's after millikins is he he muttered that is how both bindle and mrs bindle first learned that the reverend andrew mcfee was interested in their pretty niece milly hearty mrs bindle mentioned the fact of mr mcfee's call to mr hearty and from that moment he had seen in the minister a potential son-in-law the angular piety of mr mcfee rendered him an awkward not to say a clumsy lover i likes to see old mac a angin round millikins remarked bindle to mrs bindle one evening over supper it's like an hippopotamus a givin that glad eye to a canary heathen was mrs bindle's sole comment milly hearty herself had been much troubled by mr mcfee's ponderous attentions at first she had regarded them merely as the friendly interest of a pastor and a member of his flock but soon they became too obvious for misinterpretation millikins said bindle one evening as he and milly were walking home from the pictures you ain't a-going to forget charlie are you uncle joe there was reproach in milly's voice as she withdrew her arm from bindle's all right millikins said bindle capturing her hand and placing it through his arm don't get uffy old mac's been makin such a dead set at you that i wanted to know how things stood bindle's remarks had opened the floodgates of milly's confidence she told him that she had not liked to speak of it before because nothing had been said although there had been some very obvious hints from mr hearty i hate him uncle joe he's always always she paused blushing a given of you the glad eye suggested bindle i seen him oh he's horrible uncle joe i'm sure he's a wicked man course he is replied bindle with conviction or he wouldn't be a parson bindle had spoken to mr hearty about the matter look here hearty you ain't going back on them two lovebirds are you he inquired mr hearty had regarded his brother-in-law with what he conceived to be reproving dignity i do not understand joseph he remarked in hollow woolly tones well there's old mac always a-givin the glad eye to millikins explained bindle if you wish to speak of our minister joseph you must do so respectfully and i cannot listen to such vulgar suggestions 
oh come orf it arty you're only a greengrocer and greengrocers don't talk like that ere whatever they may do in heaven if you're a goin to have any anky panky with millikins over that sandy aired son of a tub thumper then you're up against the biggest thing in your life and don't you forget it bindle was angry of late joseph mr hearty replied you have shown too much desire to interfere in my private affairs and i cannot permit it oh you can't can't you said bindle that if it adn't been for me oldin my tongue you would have had no bloomin affairs for me to mix up in mr hearty paled and fumbled with the right lapel of his coat anyhow said bindle millikins is going to marry charlie dixon and if you're going to try any of your dirty tricks over old skin and oatmeal then you're going to be up against j b there are times muttered bindle as he walked away from the hearty's house when arty gets my goat and he started whistling shrilly to cheer himself up bindle was still troubled in his mind about mr hearty's scheme for millie's future and one sunday evening he determined to forego the night club in order to call upon the hearties with the object of conveying to mr mcfee in the course of conversation that millie was irrevocably pledged to charlie dixon mr mcfee had formed the habit of supping with the hearties after evening service and frequently mrs bindle was of the party bindle's sunday evening engagements at the night club had been a cause of great relief to mrs bindle for some time previously mr hardy's invitations to the bindles to take supper on sunday evenings had been growing less and less frequent it did not require a very great effort of the imagination to discover the cause bindle's racy speech and unconventional views upon religion were to mr hardy anathema and whilst they amused mrs hardy who having trouble with her breath did not seem to consider that religion was meant for her they caused mr hardy intense anguish he felt safe however in asking mr mcfee to supper on sundays because mrs bindle had confided to him that bindle was always engaged upon the sabbath night she did not mention the nature of the engagement when bindle entered the drawing-room mr hearty mr mcfee mr gupperduck and mrs bindle were gathered round the harmonium mrs hearty sat in her customary place upon the sofa waiting for someone to address her that she might confide in them upon the all-absorbing subject of her breath mr gupperduck was seated on a chair endeavouring to discipline his accordion into not sounding e sharp continuously through each hymn the others were awaiting with keen interest the outcome of the struggle got a pain ain't it inquired bindle having greeted everybody as he stood puffing volumes of smoke from one of sprague's fulham whiffs a smoke he still affected when lord windover was not present to correct his taste in tobacco well what's the joke he went on looking from the lugubrious countenance of mr mcfee to the melancholy foreboding depicted on that of mr hearty turning to mrs hearty bindle pointed his cigar at her accusingly you been tellin naughty stories martha he said i can see it look at them coves over there he turned his cigar towards mr gupperduck and mr mcfee oh martha martha and he wagged his head solemnly at mrs hearty who was already in a state of helpless laughter ain't you jest the limit and i'm a parson too millie hearty entered the room at this moment and ran up to her uncle greeting him affectionately oh uncle joe i'm so glad you've come she cried you never come to see us now well well millikins it can't be helped it's the war you know that cove llewellyn john is always wantin me round to give him advice then i have to run over and give haig an int or two ain't the kaiser jest mad when he ears i ben over because it means another push why would you believe it sir he turned to mr mcfee the reason they didn't make old indenburg a prince last birthday was because he adn't been able to land me get me joe bindle dead or alive said the kaiser to indy and i'll make you a prince and ain't old indenburg ratty bindle nodded his head knowingly millie laughed you mustn't tell such wicked fibs on sunday uncle joe she cried it's very naughty of you bindle pulled her down upon his knee and kissed her you ain't goin agin your old uncle are you millikins he cried then suddenly turning to mr hearty he inquired ain't we goin to have any ims arty ere i say can't you stop wheezy willie doin that old sport this to mr gupperduck who was still struggling to silence the mutinous e sharp sets my teeth on edge it does i'm in a rare voice to-night bought some acid drops i did as i come along and add two raw eggs in the private bar of the yellow ostrich bindle ran up a dubious scale to prove his words oh do be quiet uncle joe laughed millie you'll frighten mr mcfee away 
Bindle turned and regarded the solemn visage of Mr. McPhee, his long, immobile upper lip, his sandy hair, parted in the middle and brushed smoothly down upon his head. "'Now, Millikins,' he said with conviction, "'there ain't nothing what'll frighten a Scotchman out of England. They know what's what they do. Ain't that so, sir?' he inquired of Mr. McPhee. Mr. McPhee regarded Bindle as if he were talking in a foreign tongue. Mr. Gupperduck laid his accordion on a chair, giving up the unequal struggle. The others, taking this as a signal that music was over for the evening, seated themselves in various parts of the room. "'I'm glad you're here, sir,' said Bindle to Mr. McPhee. "'I wanted your advice on something in the Bible. Now then, Millikins, you got to sit down beside me. Can't sit on your uncle's knee when you're talking about the Bible. What'll Charlie say?' Then, turning to Mr. McPhee, with what he imagined to be great subtlety and tact, Bindle inquired, "'You ain't met Charlie Dixon, have you, sir?' Mr. McPhee shook a mournful head in negation. "'He's going to marry Millikins, ain't he, Millikins?' Millie cast her eyes down, and with heightened colour bowed her head in affirmation of Bindle's statement. "'Pretty pair they'll make, too,' said Bindle with conviction. "'I hope you'll be marrying em, sir.' Mr. McPhee looked uncomfortable. "'But that ain't what I wanted to talk to you about.' continued bindle i happened to pick up the bible to-day mrs bindle looked sharply at him and it sort of opened at a place where there was a yarn about war so i read it it was about a cove called urier and a king named david uriah the hittite murmured mr hearty urier had got a smart bird that's a gal sir bindle explained to mr mcphee and david had sort of taken a liking to her so what does david do but send urrier to the front so as he might get killed and then david pinches his gal now what i want to know sir said bindle addressing mr mcphee is what god did cause as far as i can see he was sort of fond of david now if i'd been god and david had done a thing like that i'd a raised a pretty big blister on his nose no one spoke mr hardy glanced covertly at mr mcphee who looked as if he would have given much to be elsewhere mrs bindle's lips had entirely disappeared mr hardy gasped and heaved whilst minnie blushed bindle cried mrs bindle at last bindle you forget yourself not me mrs b i come here to get what you and artie calls light now sir turning to mr mcphee what do you think god did and what do you think o that blighter david mr bindle said mr mcphee at last we must leave to providence the things that belong to providence i thought you'd agree sir you're a sport you are of course david ought to have left old urrier what belonged to urrier and not pinch his gal you wouldn't do a thing like that sir would you he inquired i wonder what the gal thought eh millikins he inquired turning to his niece if i had been her said millie i should have killed david millie gasped mr hearty how oh, how dare you say such a thing i should father replied millie quietly mr mcphee coughed mr hearty looked about him as if for something at which to clutch then with sudden inspiration he said billy we will have a hymn here let me get out cried bindle in mock alarm i can't stand wheezy willie again too much of one note good night martha my ain't you getting fat he remarked as he stood looking down at mrs hearty whereat she went off into wheezes and heavings of laughter so long artie i hope the allotments won't ruin you and bindle took his departure Millie went down to the door to see him out. "'Uncle Joe,' she whispered as she bade him good night. "'I understood.' "'Oh, you did, did you?' said Bindle. "'Ain't we getting a wise little puss, Millikins?' And Bindle walked home, whistling the long, long trail. End of chapter 7 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com